Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> it's great to have you all here this morning. I'm Lynn Garrison. Uh, I'm with North Carolina New Schools, and I'm pleased to facilitate this session of Lightning Talks. So yesterday in this room, uh, we had students who had been challenged with an innovation challenge, and so they were right in this same space making their pitches to uh, industry professionals who were serving as judges. Uh, so they were creating projects uh, to uh, inspire innovation in the area of healthy eating. Well, today we have challenged industry professionals to come forth and bring their big, bold ideas to spark innovation, spark conversation, uh, spark big ideas among educators that you can take back to the classroom and to your schools and share with colleagues and share with your students. Uh, and the challenge is they've got to present their biggest, boldest ideas in 10 minutes or less. So uh, they're called lightning talks for that reason. They're modeled after TED Talks, but they're called lightning talks because we, we didn't do the copyright thing. Uh, but you should uh, have some great engaging conversation this morning with some industry experts in the area of sustainability. And they are tackling sustainability on a variety of fronts. So you're going to hear sustainability from all directions. So I'm going to get us started. I'm going to introduce a couple of speakers at a time, and then uh, they're going to go at it. Uh, while I'm switching out their presentations, there'll be time for a question or two of that presenter. And at the very end, there'll be ample time for uh, questions of all the presenters. So let's get started. Our first presenter is Lee Clark Sellers. Uh, Lee is the Innovation Officer at Plygem Industries, which is a leader in exterior building products across North America. His background, in, uh, her background, I said his. <laughs> her background includes uh, engineering leadership and business development in the telecommunications, bioscience, computer, and building products industries. Uh, she has international experience in developing R&D capability and strategic partnerships. Uh, and brings a master's degree in management, a BS in electrical engineering uh, from North Carolina State University. I think we also have with us Ron Williams. Ron, did, that's what I thought. Uh, the second presenter will be Ron Williams. Uh, Ron is a research chemist uh, with Environmental Protection Agency. He is an air climate and energy project leader uh, with uh, EPA's Office of Research and Development. He leads a team of chemists, engineers, exposure scientists, and other researchers in the area of advanced environmental monitoring techniques. He's held several senior research positions in private, academic, and governmental research organizations, and his current research focuses on developing and evaluating emerging sensor technology and determining its applicability for meeting a wide variety of air quality monitoring needs. But first, let's hear from Lee, and then we will hear from Ron. Good morning, everybody. So I appreciate the opportunity to come in and say a few words this morning, very few words, 10 minutes worth. So we've got the, uh, the timer, I assume, that's already started. Uh, so what I was going to do is tell you a bit of a story today, and that story is a long road, and it has had a lot of turns to it. But before we start down that path, I wanted to find out how many of you have ever heard of the company Plygem before, before today? All right, so we've got a couple of head nods and a hand up. So Plygem is a building products company, just very quickly. We have about 8,000 employees uh, headquartered in Cary with about 30 manufacturing plants, and overall it's about a $2 billion company, so a fairly nice middle-sized company. And this company's focus is on building products, so it's exterior products, so everything on the outside of your house today, other than probably the garage doors. So we sell through companies like Lowe's, Home Depot, we sell to lumber yards, et cetera, so we're normally the ones that are covered up in brands, so you normally don't see Plygem, but that's the company behind the product. So with this company, the focus on the company is very much in quality, it's very much in production, it's very much in meeting customer needs. So when opportunities come up that are very different than what we do today, it's very hard, it was very hard for the company to start considering those. So what Plygem did a couple of years ago is we created a new entity called Foundation Labs. 
And the purpose of this new entity is to take a look at new opportunities. So as we look at those opportunities, it's a way to further explore those without impacting the rest of the company. So a few years ago, we had an opportunity. So we had a company that came up to us, and they're like, we are interested in recycling plastics. And we've developed a technology that, you know, if you look at the water bottle today, this is one of the most heavily recycled products we have out there. But the cap on it and the label are put in landfills. That's the one part of this product that's not recycled. And if you think about the other caps, so everything with a cap today, very, very low recycling rates around that product. So we're like, okay, let's take a look at this. Let's figure out what we can do with it. So we spent a few years around this, and it was a lot of issues with this product. We ran into challenges. We tried to look at certain products. We wanted to look at products in different ways. We want, and we found we had roadblocks each time. So we finally found a couple of products that worked with this material. We combined the plastics. We combined natural fibers. We looked at everything from hemp to rice hulls to cottons to coconut husk. We looked at a lot of different fibers. Then we looked at minerals. We looked at things like talc, things such as calcium carbonate, other carbon black, other type of chemicals that we could actually put together. So there's a lot of formulation challenges that we faced. And we finally got to the point where we had a stable material science. So we had a predictable material science that we knew it could reach certain limits, that we knew we could test it in certain ways, and we baselined it. Then we had to figure out how to process it. So the formulation is just one half. The second half of this is the processing. And the processing, do you compress it? Do you extrude it? Do you injection mold it? Lots of different ways to do high volume processing. So once we figured out the formulation, we had to continue to tweak it until we actually were able to process it. And as we're looking at this material, we first thought this would be a neat siding product. But then it's like, well, not really, because it didn't hit some of the characteristics. So we then said, let's take a look at a smaller piece of it. And we looked at it, and it's like, this would be a wonderful roof shake. This looks great. We could actually put it on the roof. So what we did, a team of scientists, we went to rock quarries. Specifically, we went to slate quarries, and we went to slate boneyards because it was important for us to find the right piece of slate to transform or to take that look and put it onto the slate shingle. So we, after about a month, 30 days of visiting rock quarries, we came out with 12 individual pieces of slate that were like, this is what we want our product to look like. So we spent quite a bit of time digitizing these pieces of slate. We took that digi digitalization and we transferred that into a mold cutter and we cut molds so it looks like the slate. So now we have a product. So this product resists fire, it resists hail, it can withstand hurricane strength winds, and it looks great. So it looks like slate, like real slate. And so we then said this is a knockout product. In parallel, what we did is we had to look at the market. Because the technology by itself is really is nice and it will sit on a shelf unless you have a counter business model with it. So you actually have to have a way to commercialize the product. If you're only looking at it from a technology focus, you will miss the game. You have to look at it as well from the market perspective. So in looking at it from the market perspective, and this was we had some really um, interesting groups here because we do a lot of work trying to build an ecosystem outside our company because we have s some competencies, but what we need are usually out in the field. So with this project, what we did is we actually had, for each semester of NC State's Masters of Global Innovation Management Studies, long term for MGEM, we had a semester team every semester from MGEM work with us on the business case to help us look at different aspects, look at it really from fresh eyes. You know, somebody who knows nothing about the industry, nothing about the market, how would you tackle this? This year, we combined it with a Keenan Fellow uh, and her class. So we sponsored a Keenan Fellow last summer in Fair Bluff, North Carolina, which is where our R&D and manufacturing is. And Ms. Patillo out of Columbus County, we engaged her 10th grade students this semester along with the NC State students. So they combined are trying to help us solve some problems from a marketing perspective. So it's interesting because one of those challenges was help us find a name. So the 
master's level students came up with some names. The 10th graders came up with some names. And guess what? We're going to use one of the 10th grader names. Right? So it's been a great collaboration and use of the students of Miss Patillo. Her sem or summer that she spent with us, she actually created a business curriculum around new product introduction, around how do you find these new innovative type products. So they're going to help us name the next product that we make. So the marketing aspect is also has a lot of pitfalls, just like the technology side. So what we started to employ here is a lot of analytics, big data. We started looking at how do we actually get down to low level to the houses themselves to understand what houses have slate roofs, what houses want slate roofs. Well, that's something that's not in housing permits. So we've used everything from Google Earth to look at their visualization technology and to try to figure out is that an asphalt roof, is that a cedar roof, is that a slate roof. We've used different other visualiz visualization technology that I can't really get into right now to do the same thing. But the analytics are the big missing piece that we find around how do you actually find a market. So we've tried to combine the technology approach of using recycled plastics, plastics that no one else wants, with analytics, how do you determine a market, and how do you look at this market from different approaches. And we put that together. And then we said, we have to validate this product now. And when we go to market, we validate on three different topics. One is, we validate the product. Is it hitting our product characteristics? Is the slate roof holding up the way we want? And one success story we had early on is we sent it over to Australia to test it. Because one of the things about exterior building products is they have to be weatherable. So we found the worst climates across the globe. And we found those in Australia. We found in Australia one of the hottest places and one of the driest places on the earth. And we survived a cyclone. That was good news. We were glad. We were really sorry that the area had a cyclone. <laughs> but our product did great. So that was another reassurance that the product is going to perform. Well, then we have to make sure that we hit the customer. Do the customers like it? We need people to like this product. It's not enough that it's a great product, but we've got to have people to like it. And so we've had fantastic feedback from a very small launch that we're looking at. And then the market. Is the market going to accept this, or is the market really just want asphalt roofs? Can we actually find a market? So we actually have had some good luck with the small scale. And our plans are, with this material, is now we're going to look at a larger scale launch. We're going to actually look at going to a wider geography with this new product. But what I find even more exciting is the next phase. Because the next phase is one where we don't know what's going to happen. We've got multiple paths. So we've developed this new material science. So now we, we need to continue with this. We've put a lot of investment. We've got this one product called Roof that we can do, slate roofs. We're looking at others. We're looking at a cedar roof and a barrel tile roof along with that. I want to talk to my friend here, Joe, and try to figure out how we can put solar on that roof. Then we're going to look at other products as well in other industries. The automotive industry is going to be undergoing some major change coming up because of the new uh, miles per gallon requirements. So how can we factor into that industry? So we're going to look across industry as well that we've developed this material science because, by the way, we have a lot of plastic still going in landfills. And that problem is not going away anytime soon. So until that problem goes away, we're going to try to figure out how we can leverage it, how we can combine it with natural fibers, and how we can create new materials and new products for the future use. So with that, what I want to do is to leave you all with a quote. I enjoy this quote from Mark Twain. It's, don't be afraid to try new waters, to try new avenues. You make sure that you explore, you dream, you discover. To me, this encompasses a lot of what it takes to look at new technologies, look at new markets, and figure out where do you go next with these. And I heard my timer, so good timing. All right, so as you're changing slides, are there any questions that I can answer? All right, so I will get ready for the next uh, speaker. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, I've had an opportunity to be a citizen science teacher for a number of years, uh, working in the Dublin, uh, Durham County school systems. And so when I was putting this together, I was coming at it from that perspective in terms of technology. How many of you actually teach science, math, 
Okay, good, because this is geared towards you. I'm trying to give you some take-home ideas that you can go there and actually use in the classroom um, that you can run with because the one thing that I've learned in my, uh, I've taught quite a bit in a lot of different type of settings, including the university settings, is that the more you can keep people active, the more you can engage them in the activity and actually get them to buy in. And so what I'm going to be trying to provide for you is some ideas that you can readily use. Everybody wants their own data. You heard that term, big data, and it's true. It's a blessing and a curse because once you collect big data, by God, then you've got to figure out a way to go there and analyze it. And it's not cheap and it's not easy. But that's where we all want to be. People want to collect their own data. They want to understand what's happening. I tell people all the time as a, as a research scientist, the air that this young lady is breathing is different than the man in the, the purple shirt. Guarantee you they're breathing different air. They can live in the same house. They can be breathing different air. People want to know how they're being exposed. Time activity, where you spend your time and what you're doing affects your exposure. And we understand that. And people want to know about it because they're interested in their own well-being. One of the things that we've done, and I encourage you to go to this website, because almost everything I'm talking about today, we're building for you at EPA, and it's the Citizen Science Toolbox. It has a host of materials, including the Sensor User Guidebook. I've published almost 200 peer review papers, which is a lot for, for a lot of scientists. This particular guidebook has been downloaded over 100,000 times internationally and nationally. It's just flown off the shelves. People are interested in how to use sensors, what do they need to understand about sensors, if they're going to buy a sensor, what do they need to look for, what are the questions to be asked. And this is a tool designed for you. It's written at the 12th grade level, specifically so that students and others can read it and understand it so that before they go and jump into a project, they understand what pollutants are interesting, what pollutants might they be interested in monitoring, and what they need to understand about that. I'm going to be giving you some ideas about some of the technologies. I have to use this disclaimer. We can't recommend any of these um, because we just can as a federal agency, but I wanted to give you a taste of what are some of the things that are on the market. Of course, there are the cell phone apps. And there are a lot of those that are out there now that provide you the ability to go there and access environmental data or even collect environmental data. There are also the small microcomputers, the Arduinos or the Strawberry Pies. We're using a lot of those in our small technologies. I'm building sensor kits that citizens are using all over the U.S. Some of these only cost a couple hundred dollars. Some may cost a thousand dollars or more, but we often are using microcomputers to run the programs, to review data, do that first pass of data quality assurance, to go there and store data. And these, we've discovered that students love programming these small Arduinos. It gives them hands-on capabilities, and it's very inexpensive. It doesn't take too much to do that. Also, you see the communication, the Zigbee. We're doing a lot of things where we're putting multiple small environmental stations, some literally the size of Oh, a brick, for lack of a better phrase. We're actually using small sensor packages like that spread out over large areas and then using small um, little communication pods like that Zigbee right there to daisy chain them so one will speak to another, which will speak to another, and actually saturate an area with communication technology so we can understand what's happening in place to place. And there are a lot of crowdsourcing um, materials that are available. You might see the air quality egg. That's one of many where mostly creative people, um, rather more so than technology people, have decided to go there and jump into the environmental monitoring aspect because they have design specialists. That's not a bad thing. It's just that you always want to make sure you have good engineering along with design when you're trying to go there and collect data. Here's some examples of things that are available to us. This is a, 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 a product out of France. It's the Sinceris um, line. It uses a smartphone. That device over to the far left is the actual monitoring. It's about three inches by a half inch by about two inches. Weighs about four ounces. Sells for just a couple hundred dollars. It collects data in real time, which is then um, sent to a web service via cell phone. It goes to the web service. It then comes back to your cell phone. So in real time, you can take measurements, look at it as you're walking around a city, and store the data 
in an archive. And there are many such examples like that. This particular one looks at temperature and carbon monoxide and particulate matter and noise level. And that's just one of many examples. And people love to graphically look at their data. There's goods and bads about that. But people love to do it, so why not give it to them? Um, especially if it means your data processing time is, is shortened. If your ultimate goal is, in my neighborhood, different than this neighborhood in terms of a research curriculum, give it to them in a graphic. Let them do it automatically. There's also the opportunity for your students to build their actual sensors. I really encourage you to do that. I mean, get out the soldering iron, take the circuits. These are very, very simple devices made by air casting. That's a friend of mine and a colleague, uh, Michael Heimbinder, uh, who's done a lot of work in the New York, New Jersey area, assembling these small kits, which are adaptable. Maybe your student wants to look at particulate matter, the dust in the air, or carbon monoxide, or maybe they want to look at um, some other pollutant. You can actually buy the sensor as a class, put it together, and use it. And this device will operate for about a year before the sensor will go bad. You're looking at a couple hundred dollars investment. And it has built-in Wi-Fi, and the data streams immediately to a, an app for, for viewing. Or you could go a little bit more high-tech. This is another company out of France um, that looks at multiple devices, multiple pollutants, in this case, uh, volatile organic compounds, um, like the benzene there. Uh, a lot of people are interested in the organics. Um, it measures in real time. It runs for multiple days without any change in battery. You literally just have to take that red toggle out of the device and it starts collecting data. How much more simple can it be? Those are the types of things that are available. Another thing that I want you to think about is why not get your class involved in, I probably get five to 10 calls from citizens every week saying, um, Ron, I wanna go there and do a measurement. I don't have any resources. And in the agency, we just don't give money away. But we do provide for grants and other opportunities. And many of these are geared toward high schools and other types of educational programs. On that toolbox website, I actually have a, um, a student who's working with me, and every month we update all of the available funding sources that we can find geared towards you. So maybe your students would like to go to that website and see if there's a $1,000 grant or a $10,000 grant that's geared toward them by both private and public and other entities that are available to you. We're making it available to you so that you can get some of these funding opportunities. Again, you can go there and build your own apps. You could go there and actually partner with some of the groups that are doing this, like Public Labs, where they're actually providing small sensor kits that can be used, both air and water. It's just a matter of choosing one, obtaining it, working with that. If you want to go, um, again, kind of low cost, you can do things like the spec. This is a device made out of Carnegie Mellon. They're creative laboratories. It's for $100. It measures the dust in the air. I won't say that it measures as well as what the state of North Carolina measures when um, they use their regulatory monitoring. It doesn't. It can't. But that being said, you can still use this device to go there and what I call at least um, it is an indicative monitor. It can tell you whether there's differences in the kitchen as compared to out in the parking lot. Is there a difference there? You may not have the exact number of what the particles in the air are, but you can use it to build a classroom curriculum. And there are other devices like the Dylos and also water turbidity meters. Not too expensive. You don't have to collect your own data. You can actually use data that we're making available to you. You may be familiar with the Village Green. Google that. It's one of the most successful programs we've done in the agency. In fact, we're putting out, we've got a station outside of a library here in Durham County. It's about five miles away from this location. It's the first real-time air quality monitor where data is provided to the citizens ever by a federal government agency. Myself and Gail Hagler put them out about a year and a half ago. We now are installing these in multiple cities. You can go to this website and pull data in real time, graph it, look at it. We put all those things there for you. Your students can understand. What are the differences in ozone concentration in the summer versus the winter? How much does it change day versus night? What is the influence of rain and other factors on that? The data is there. You don't have to collect data. It even does all the graphing and stuff. You actually have assets available to you all the time, free of charge, where your students can go there and acquire data, look at it, and make scientific hypotheses. And so that's some suggestions for you. And so I'm going to stop. That's all that I have. I want to take some time and ask 
and see if there's any questions. Again, you can collect data fairly low cost, fairly inexpensively. You can use data assets that are already available to you. You have the toolbox that is a great resource guide that gives a lot of ideas. Questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There are many, many such products like that. It is a great price. Um, water is much more expensive to monitor than air. Nobody's ever told you that. It's the truth because water is not a happy medium. <laughs> I mean, things happen in water. And fresh water is easier to do than salt water. You get into brackish water, salt water. A device like this may last a month. I know it wouldn't even last a month. It may last a couple of weeks because of just the corrosion and other things that are going on and the bioaquatic life that likes to build up on things dipping in water. But for freshwater measurements, ponds, rivers, streams, it's a great class project. Good question. Others? Sir? Yeah. It gives the student um, an idea of what, what might they measure in the air. It gives them a list of pollutants and what those pollutants typically, what type of concentrations we typically find in the air and the things that typically influence those concentrations. For instance, nitrogen dioxide. You're breathing nitrogen dioxide right now. It's part of your just living. Well, you also find that around highways. You also find that when you have uh, combustion products like maybe gas stoves and other types of things. And so that guidebook gives you an idea if one wants to understand and map their area of how they're being exposed, it gives you ideas about sources and what the concentrations typically are. So it gives them something to compare to. I saw other hands. Very good. Okay, now I'm pleased to introduce our next two speakers. Uh, Joe Carr is CEO of Simprius Incorporated, uh, which is a leader in substantial, and, and he is a leader in substantial management and product development experience in semiconductors, optoelectronics, and high performance materials. Joe has served as the CEO and member of the board of directors for several companies, both public and private. Uh, and earned his BS and uh, his BS degree in electrical engineering from Rose Holman Institute of Technology and his executive MBA from Babson College. Uh, and after Joe will come Bob Stia. Uh, Bob is uh, an environmental engineer with the Division of Water Resources in the North Carolina Department of Environmental Natural Resources. He's the chair of the North Carolina Drought Management Advisory Council and has worked both domestically and overseas in the private and public sectors on water supply and quality programs. Uh, Joe will come forth first and we'll figure out why this is a black screen. Is it supposed to be black? There we go. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Light at, at all different frequencies, everything from very high frequencies to low frequencies. And we're going to talk a little bit about that back when we get the chance to talk about the control system. So, the first thing is, is some of the things we've been concerned to do is well, if we use this gas or air that's you know, smarter than that, which is 1.3 times ten to the 30 kilos per million, but that makes fun. <laughs> That equates to about 
for Joe while I swap out the kids said, well, you know, is there going to be enough water for us? One of my kids said, um, is the water going to be safe to drink? You know, and my teenage daughter was like, you know, can I take a hot shower tonight? You know, that's her challenge. Uh, so I kind of based my talk on this. Now, I deal with, uh, I think a lot about drought. Uh, I chair the, uh, the drought council. North Carolina has a, a really great drought council. Um, you know, fortunately, we're not in a drought right now. probably heard in the news that uh, California is undergoing a big drought, probably biggest in, uh, they say, like in the last hundred years. And uh, if you read on the news, they show parched earth and dried lakes, and you know, everybody's worried and what they're going to do. Uh, and now started, everybody's starting to think about it. It's now a big, interesting topic. And people ask in my industry, well, you know, how long is this going to go on? That's the big thing. You know, help us have some perspective here. Is this like going to be a two or three year thing or is this going to be a long term thing? I'm not sure if you have any other points around this, but uh, so, someone did a study on, on, on how dry the West has been over history. Uh, the, the current drought is probably the worst in the last, let's say, 100 years, okay? uh, which is pretty bad. Uh, but some, there's been some cool research. Uh, people have, have looked back over a thousand year period. Now, when you talk to climatologists, I'm not a climate, I'm an engineer. When you talk to climatologists, they think in terms of thousands of years. And they've done some cool tree ring studies. Uh, that, well, they put out some data that showed how, dress, how, how, how dry the West has been in the last thousand years. Now, if you look way to the, to the right, um, you see that little red blip there? That's the current drought right now. The red is drought, the, the, the blue is, is, is wet. Now if you look at the last 150, that's when California became a state. Fortunately for the last 150 or so years, it's been the, one of the wettest periods in history. And everything's been built and based on that wetness. Now if you go back way in time, if you want to see how bad it could get, if you look back about you know 800 to 1,000 years ago, I mean, there's 200 year long dry spells that were drastically dry. I mean, could you imagine if that, if we're just at the beginning of one of those mega droughts again? I mean, that's how bad things, you know, if you want to talk about how bad things could get, look, I mean, you know, you look back in history, it could get bad. You never know. It might, it might get, we might enter a wettest period in history. You just don't know. So it's in, an interesting topic. It's boring, yet it's important. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of things that, you know, a lot of things we do are based on this. So water scarcity is definitely something, you know, the next generation is thinking about. You know, are we going to have uh, water available with our current infrastructure? Uh, another thing is water safety. Now, this, this is uh, something uh, that's probably a little more interesting from a science perspective. Uh, before uh, 
I worked uh, in my current position in state government. I worked in the food and beverage industry as a as a wa as a I'm a chemical engineer by training. Uh, I worked in uh, the water quality division of a, 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 a large beverage company. I can't tell you who they were, but uh, I bleed blue. Let's put it that way. Uh, I didn't work for the red guys. And uh, my job was to think about what's in our water. I mean, an interesting question. There's a couple of us, and that's all we did. And we thought, you know, what's in the water that makes the beverage? You know, this company is selling probably, I think, 80 billion gallons of water in their beverages every year. And one of the interesting topics that came up when I was working for them was pharmaceuticals. Do you guys remember that, the pharmaceutical story? You know, it kind of hit the, hit the headlines, and it kind of, you know, people lost interest. Because it's kind of like, okay, what's the next big thing? They're still out there. Uh, this is an interesting study. I think it was in 2008. We basically tested this together. From uh, at that time, all of the utilities that, that detected pharmaceuticals in their drinking water that was being sold to the public. Now it's interesting, you know. We're going to sell it to your system, but I can't. But you know, a lot of these chemicals are not like measured or regulated, so there's no law saying you have to remove it. So they're kind of just there. Um, now talk about, you know, it's one thing to say, okay, it's out there in nature. It's another thing to say it's in my can of soda, you know. And we put all that, I mean, companies are putting tons of you know, resources and time into thinking about, is this product safe? Not only, like, you know, scientifically safe, but from a public perception standpoint. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a daunting challenge. You know, water safety going forward for the next generation you think about all the chemicals that we think of, that we use, they all end up in our waterway. You know, the big one right now, we follow this all the time with my job, the big one right now is a micro bead in, in uh, personal care products. You guys have, you know, you buy something with a little micro bead and you rub it and you can take it. There is like, uh, I mean, I don't know, millions of tons of them in the Great Lakes. And fish are eating them, because that's where all the big production companies the fish are eating microbes, and we're eating the fish. So a lot of plastics are coming into the food chain through that. So interesting stuff. So safety in the next generation. Uh, the last thing I'll talk about is equity. Water equity. Uh, is there is it there's only is there enough water for us? Is there enough water for everybody? Okay, this is a great picture. I, I had the opportunity to work overseas in Africa for about ten years. South Africa, Kenya, and Ghana on water projects, and talk about the most life-changing, like life-altering experiences I had. Uh, we're all around working on small village water projects, you know, trying to make sure the water is clean for people who can barely make ends meet day to day. Um, this is probably going forward for our, for our next the next generation the biggest challenge that people will face. You know, right now in the world of what, seven billion people, there's about a billion people that don't have uh, any adequate safe drinking water. And, and about of the seven billion, three billion people don't have adequate sanitation. San by sanitation, I mean, I, I believe it's a half mile walk to a toilet. Three billion people don't have a toilet within half a mile of where they live. And it's an incredible, daunting, I mean, how, you know, how, how do we ensure equity for this type of thing. I just my last slide here, I have a couple of images on some of the projects I worked on. Uh, on the top left, there's a slum in Kenya called Kibera. I don't know if you guys worked overseas, thought about overseas. A billion people, uh, no, sorry, a million people in two square miles. Incredible. The picture on the top right is a picture inside that slum. Incredible concentration of people and, you know, and all of the waste that goes along with that. I tell people I fell into this career by accident, literally. I fell into a stream like that when I was working on a project. And, you know, when I went and worked on those projects, it was a very academic exercise for me. When I came out of that stream, it was a very passionate <laughs> 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 career changed moment for me. I thought, how can people live like this and go through this every day? Uh, a 
Bottom of Street Pictures, I'd like to work for a great organization. Uh, you know, it's called Leave and the Actors. It has to be the only foundation. And a lot of that, all that money goes to charity. We created uh, one of the final charities called the Safe Water Network. And that's a good one to start with. Uh, great, great project. Um, that, that middle one there, that yellow line, is um, it was a project beside that slum. We, we, we brought in some water tanks. And those are people lining up. I mean, people, the typical family in Kenya spends an hour a day getting one of those dairy cans of water. And that dairy can is about five gallons. About, about 30 minutes waiting to fill it, and then you know 30 minutes kind of filling it, bringing it home, and everything. So you're talking an hour a day. They're, the income they spend on getting that dairy can is about 10 percent of, of how much they spend, of how much they make in a month. So imagine the typical family, what in North Carolina makes about 50,000 a year. Can you imagine your water bill is five thousand dollars? It's incredible. But to them, that's what they do. It's every day, they spend that much money on getting that one dairy can. It's about a, they end up with about a gallon per person per day for their family. And that's what they get. But, you know, for them, that, that project is magic. Just real quick, um, this is the work in Ghana we did. Uh, we put up this kind of equivalent of almost like a gas station. You know, just making the water more available to people so you pump their water to it. Um, Available. The other one is that guy down there. He's actually building that. He's got a track down there. That's a that's a cistern uh, that that we we work with to uh, help people store water. You know, we bring one month, and then the other eleven months is just like how do you keep that water stored so that you can use the rest of the year? So really interesting project. That's all I gotta say. The waste is still there. People don't like touching it. So how do you get it to where it needs to go so you can do it? You know, your food is get back. Okay, four powerful lightning talks already. We've got two to go. Make sure that you're making note of your questions because there'll be ample time at the end for questions for all of our lightning talk presenters. Here, here are the next two. Uh, Sandy Chronic uh, is CEO and founder of Eastern Carolina Organics and partners with organic farmers around the state to build a sustainable organic food system in North Carolina. Sandy and the team at Eastern Carolina Organics recognize the need for viable production and distribution networks between organic farmers and their existing and potential customers and have forged new pathways for successful distribution. They now sell over $4 million of produce an annually and they've paid regional organic farmers over $16 million over their 10 year history. And then our next speaker will be Renee Daughtry uh, Renee is an advanced services project manager overseeing advanced technology testing at Cisco Systems. He oversees engineering teams in the U.S. and in India. Uh, each project he manages is scoped at more than $15 million annually. And he has inspired hundreds of students across North Carolina to pursue higher education and consider careers in science, technology, engineering, and math through an aggressive outreach effort that brings students to Cisco campuses, uh, in addition to establishing Cisco network academies at universities around the state. We'll turn to Sandy first. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Can, I, can everybody hear me? Thank you. Everybody did use the mic. Okay. Um, well, I'm very excited that I got to come 
after you because I think a lot of what you said really feeds into what we're doing at Eastern Carolina Organics. We, um, we're very affected by the California drought, ironically, and um, we really are a social enterprise trying to build solutions to um, problems um, similar to the Newman's Own Foundation. So um, Eastern Carolina Organics, and I made notes because I've never spoken in just 10 minutes, so I'm going to stay on time here. We're a wholesale produce distribution company. Our focus is on locally grown, certified organic fruits and vegetables from family farms throughout North Carolina. We really started with a humble concept. The question was, are people really going to put their money where their mouth was? Are they really going to come out and support local organic farms on a day-to-day -day basis? Is this a hardcore commitment? Or was this going to be a fun event that grocery stores wanted to hang signs about for Earth Day, for example? But we've been around since 2004. We've grown from an experiment to our warehouse that we own now in East Durham, from where we ship products all up and down the East Coast, and we've paid North Carolina farmers over $16 million to date. Our picture of one of our farmers is actually standing in the hallway here. We're really happy to be selling food to the RTP Sheridan, actually. So they're a customer of ours for several years now. Hope you enjoy your meals. Um, we're happy to say that the commitment and the facts around local and organic agriculture are really not a fad. Any given day, I might be dealing with a broken truck on the road or trying to find a home for seven boxes or seven pallets of cabbage, helping a farm transition maybe from conventional peanuts to organic peanuts, or integrating a new farmer into our ownership model. And just like you, any given day, you're probably helping to sharpen a student's confidence for that next test, teaching them to sneeze into their elbows, into their, in, into their elbows instead of their hands, perhaps, or preparing them to behave well and open their minds for an upcoming poetry reading, or reminding them to sneeze into their elbows instead of their hands sometimes. So like you, my job is not glamorous every day, but at the end of the day, we're really all trying to do nothing less than save the world, and we should keep that ambition at the forefront every day. Like, um, your efforts are really no joke, and it doesn't matter what segment of education you fall into, I know you're fighting in the trenches every day for it. And similarly, whatever segment of agriculture I fall into, I'm also fighting for it every single day. You can believe in that. Unfortunately, however, as a friend of mine had said, whatever your cause is, it's a lost cause on a dying planet. This is really serious stuff. And it's scary, but it's true. And I'm not going to stand here and say that I'm not concerned about things like pesticides or genetically modified organisms, because I am. But I'm not here because of what I'm against. That I found a long time ago to not be very sustainable or pleasant. I'm here because of what I'm fighting for, and it's for a clean, healthy food supply for all citizens. The positive pressure in this statement right here is that it's unifying for all of us. It should help to remind us all that none of the compartmentalized hard work that we do every day is worth it if we can't remember and integrate the common cause of sustaining a healthy future. From that perspective, we're really partners, and so that's why I'm really happy to be here today. The good news is that there's a lot of reason for hope. There's a great story from Food Corps, which is a really innovative program at public schools around the country, um, from an elementary school in Mississippi is where this picture is taken. And after months of working in the garden and preparing the soil and watering the seeds and keeping the weeds out, the students were finally ready to get in and dig out the fruits of all that hard labor. They were ready to go pluck their radishes out of the ground. And one young boy got down on the ground and on, he was on his hands and knees and as he gently tugs all of this momentous, climactic moment towards his face, it kind of comes right at him and this was his response. I smell Jesus! And we, are, we have tons of these beautiful stories that you will remember more than any other scientific data I can preach to you right now. But it's not just the fun anecdotal stories that we have to show off. There are real programs that are working in real schools, public schools around the country, and especially in North Carolina, I'm proud to say. Some schools realized that they could just be a drop spot for some local organic farmers to come meet families when they would pick up their children to make it easier for families to be going home with fresh fruits and vegetables to prepare for dinner that night. We work with one school customer where a classroom of parents chip in for a box of mixed vegetables to take home each week, but it's the students who are spending an hour every week in their classroom dividing up the money, dividing up the product by the pound or the pint or the cucumber, bagging it all up and even preparing recipes to send home and really sell to their families to prepare for dinner that night. In one North Car oops, sorry. In one North Carolina district, the sustainability manager designed a food composting program 
In only seven and a half months, the elementary and middle schools have diverted 93 tons of waste from the landfill. It is remarkable, equal to the reduction of carbon from driving 200,000 miles. The schools reduced cafeteria trash from an average total of 155 bags a day down to 18 total bags a day, an 89% reduction. Designed to be cost neutral, they have saved $40,000 on dumpster fees. Who needs to be saving that much money for dumpster fees if you can retain it for other causes? And they're even getting compost back now, fresh, well-tilled soil to put into their school gardens or on the landscaping on the grounds. The most important point of all of these stories is that the children, not just that the children are learning how to take a 45 pound box of squash and divide it up per 22 bags, but they're learning why. They're not just learning how to divide their food waste from landfill waste, but they're understanding why. It's becoming more normative to them, and that's really incredible. That's why we really need to stay hopeful and commit even more to this partnership. By now, it's really well accepted that superior academic performance requires proper nutrition in order to support the health and activity of the nerve cells in our brains. This is especially true for children. I'm sure you all know this on a daily basis. Adequate nutrition ensures that students can fully express their potential for success. And, on, and conversely, research also shows us that children who eat an unhealthy diet of highly processed foods or are simply malnourished tend to have lower test scores and more behavior problems. New research comes out all the time to help us understand these patterns. And there's a lot of evidence pinpointing the impacts of pesticides and other chemicals on childhood um, neurodevelopment and behavioral disorders. Some examples include that the levels of, for example, vitamin C in organic tomatoes are 50% higher than in con conventional tomatoes. Um, various pesticides have been linked with illness to illnesses from allergies to depression to Parkinson's disease. So we're watching studies all the time come out. But the simple truth is that we need to make clean, fresh fruits and vegetables more accessible to all children. And that's my job, and that's your job. Remember, we're partners. <laughs> the average age of the American farmer is currently 58.3. The lack of young farmers coming into agriculture means that this figure creeps constantly towards retirement at a very fast pace. This is important for many issues like food security, including the drought in California, um, land stewardship, and preserving farming as a cultural way of life that we all really tend to appreciate. Even if we're driving to the beach, we like driving by farmland usually. At ECO, sustainability doesn't just mean the product that we sell, but the relationships that we have and the way we operate internally on a daily basis. It really means constantly looking at stimulus within and outside of our environment and trying to respond to it. To us, that meant that when we turned 10 years old, we conducted a study to see if we were following that same trajectory of the average age, or if our farmers tended to be slightly younger. I'm really happy to say that from 2004 to 2013, we learned that our farmers were not only significantly younger, but our trend, in fact, was decreasing. We went from 53 down to 48 during that time. And in fact, the farmer's face outside of there, his, his next generation is on the farm. We don't really want to just know this is not them. We don't want to just know that, this, that we have young farmers in the, our family. That's nice. We can pat ourselves on the back for it. But what's really important is are our current farmers going to tell their children, stay on the farm? This is a good way of life. You can take care of your family with this living. That's really important. Is this a dignified profession that feels secure to people? We had the acting commissioner of the USDA visit us about a year ago to tour our warehouse. And he said, well, when I grew up, my parents said to me around the dinner table on a weekly basis, son, if you work really hard and you do well in school, you also can grow up to become a farmer. And we kind of had this lament, you know, we lamented this mournful moment that that's really not happening as much these days. There's a massive generational gap in that kind of a conversation. It's very uncommon for, pe for kids to be hearing that. At ECO, we're not only committed to making sure that kids want to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, but also that we're part of a trend of kids wanting to grow fresh fruits and vegetables. Be leery of the posters in your supermarket with the fresh and shiny farmer's faces looking very young and very happy and not at all overworked and exhausted and underpaid. But with an educated consumer base that knows not to be greenwashed, I really am happy to see these celebrity farmers' faces up there in the stores because I think we really can usher in a renewed era 
of respect and stability for farmers, and especially produce farmers, vegetable farmers. Now, who can think of this iconic fresh vegetable, fresh fruit, this item that's just about to hit for seasons, that, that crop that you know off-season, imported, could never compete with the flavor that you could get from a fresh farm nearby? It's the strawberry. I knew you all knew it. It's not just around this time of year that I like to talk about strawberries, but um, because if there's one thing I could push along in the sustainable agriculture movement, it's what I would call food mindfulness. This has a lot of hope for us in terms of health and well-being as well. You can make jelly or a salad or a soup or a pie with strawberries, but really what we all like to do is shovel them down, right? Let's make sure you know what goes into this one bite wonder. This is farmers, after planting them in the fall, covering them up with some frost protection. A lot of hard work right there. Next, in the winter, they have to run tons of water, not to protect and keep that plant um, hydrated, but because of that precious pocket of warmer air between the ice and the, f and the um, plants themselves. This is really critical, and farmers literally stay up all night keeping these irrigation heads from freezing just to maintain this frost protection through the winter. This is pretty much what the crop looks like right now. It's a little late in the season. And all of those flower buds will turn into berries. Um, the most important thing is that we really need to be savoring life more, and we need to be enjoying our food more. Michael Pollan, a food writer, has said, pay more, eat less. I know it's very simplified comment, but it's really something that anyone can take to heart in terms of moving the sustainable agriculture movement along a little bit further and integrating it more into any other scientific process that you're advocating for in the classroom. Um, this, this is my closing slide, um, is a post that we put up on Facebook recently after a really long and hard winter this year. And it says, when you grow food or eat based on what's available from your sustainable food shed, you cultivate patience. And we invited some other people to suggest an alternate word for patience. And some people wrote in freedom, tradition, resilience, pride, and tolerance for something that's less than ideal. Who wouldn't want to imbue some of these virtues on our next generation? Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Renee Daustry from Cisco, and I've been in again with my bio. You heard I've been get encouraged a lot of students to get into the STEM fields of work and innovation and things of that nature. My work has taken me to hang out with celebrities. Wooly Bully from the Durham Bulls <laughs> came to the Cisco campus, and we had a really good time. And I got to follow this crowd. Jesus Christ. It's going to be very interesting. I'm not going to talk about technology, even though I'm Cisco. I want to talk about some tools and things that I've 
enhanced and worked with a lot of students with and teachers to help enhance the students' uh, learning capabilities. Uh, I went to school, when I went to school, we talk, I had a teacher that spoke in the front of the room, talking head, we took notes and we paid attention. The students now are totally innovative. Smartphones, devices is what they use. As instructors, let's use that. The U.S., the lowest in STEM curriculum, STEM graduation, it's, an, it's a known fact. All we want to do, and what I'd like to do, is get my students to be competitive with the rest of the world. So let's take a look and see the things that are out there now. What do we do? What do we do for these students? Some of the things to look in these websites. We're gonna, first, we can go actually step into their world, the 21st century world is the way I like to look at it. And by looking at some of the things that's out here already, that's free, free. The Show Door Educational Center, Oop. the Show Door Educational Center in Durham, North Carolina, www.showdoor.com. The executive director is Mr. Robert Pandoff, and I asked him, where did he get the name Show Door? And he said to me, when I was in college, they said I was short and dorky. So <laughs> I put together my organization, <laughs> and it came up with Show Door. Innovative, games, free games, math and science games, for the instructors and the, edu and the students to enhance their, their learning capability. Games in algebra, geometry, trigonometry, science games, things that are here to get these students engaged in what you're teaching them. Because again, they're super innovative, super innovative. Also, I've got a lot of educators who come to me and they go, my high schoolers want internships, something we encourage. Unfortunately, Cisco doesn't have high school internships. Shodor Educational Center does. So as educators, you can build an account, start looking at this. They actually have paid internships for high school students. So please encourage our students to get out there to get some type of work experience and help build their resumes. There's a social group, called, there's an uh, application called Yammer. And a lot of companies use this. In school, you say, oh, no Facebook. Educators, create a social media sp 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 a place for them so they can have Facebook-like capabilities. You can create these social groups and then have the students work together. Quick, quick for instance, I worked with uh, Panther Creek High School over here in uh, Cary, North Carolina. And we created a Yammer account so they can collaborate with their, the high school, with their high school peers in the UK. The teachers controlled it. So they did, they did projects together, they, did they actually created applications together, but the instructors were able to monitor their online, online uh, uh, social network and enhance what they were doing. So again, something to use to help the students. Now Google. We all know about the cloud and Google Docs. I'll give you, for example, my son goes to uh, Sterling Montessori. He is 13 years old. He came down the other day to do his homework, and he had his earbuds in, bopping down the steps, and he had his iPod in his hand. My wife was ready to say something to him. I said, no, watch what he does. He went to my Mac. He had FaceTime up collaborating with his, with his peers in eighth grade. He brought up Google Docs. They did their project in Google Docs. And then he came back to, came, went back to school the next day, brought it down from Google Docs and presented it. Again, look at these tools out here and get your students totally engaged in their social media. It's the only way to go. Futures for Kids, Cisco sponsored partner. Your students are looking for mentors. We always encourage students to have mentors. In this stage in my career, I have a mentor. Educators, you create account, an account. The students create an account. They have various mentors on this website, like myself. Went through a vigorous background check. I am now a certified mentor for the state of North Carolina. I can safely speak to minors. This is what you want. You want a safe haven. 
you want somewhere where students can ask professional questions or even for them to help with homework. I help many students across North Carolina with their homework. They'll ask me questions. Mr. Daughtry, the favorite question, how much do you get paid? <laughs> they all want to know, but I can safely answer that. So again, encourage your students, high school, middle school students, create account on Futures for Kids. Moodle, people familiar with Moodle? Good, good, good. If you're not, another wonderful website and a powerful community. I've seen teachers now record, do a video recording of their classes, post it on Moodle, post the grades, post homework and assignments on Moodle. So now, as an instructor, you know sometimes our students, God bless their souls, are doing things they're not supposed to be doing in class, or they fall asleep, or they're doing something. But if it's on Moodle, they can go back and review it at a later date on their smart devices. So again, my millenniums, my 21st century students, I want to use and access the things they're using to enhance their learning experience. So again, just look at these things. See how can you use them to help enhance the students' experience. And lastly, LinkedIn. And I use my own profile. Bless you. LinkedIn, according to didyouknow.org, LinkedIn is the number one recruiting tool in the United States. I've got middle school students that I bring to the Cisco campus. I've got them starting early to build their professional resume and profile on LinkedIn. Because ladies and gentlemen, here's what happens. And I know this for a fact. People do a search on LinkedIn. They'll put in keywords, manager, project manager, engineer. Mr. Rene Dorfee pops up. The recruiter now wants the link to me. The recruiter will look at my profile, maybe give me a call, and go, Mr. Daughtry, we have this opportunity. Would you be interested? So the best time to get these students involved and to build their professional profiles is now. I tell students when I was growing up, they told me, well, Rene Daughtry, it's who you know. Ah, things have changed. It's who knows you. Social media, powerful. Cisco, EMC, IBM, all these companies are on LinkedIn. Cisco and all these other companies post jobs on LinkedIn. They can join various groups, National Society of Black Engineers, project management groups, different type of groups to join to get information and to build their network. That's the key now. Who knows you? Who knows what, what skills you have? So slowly but surely, getting these students engaged in this, they'll start to build their network. They'll start to put all their, their experiences out on LinkedIn. They'll join other groups and other companies. And now they can be well employed. Opportunity. Mr. Renee Daughtry just turned down a, please don't tell on me. <laughs> I've got a Cisco HR person in the room. I've turned down an, an, an employment opportunity with CSX as a project manager for $75,000 a year, all because of LinkedIn. So ladies and gentlemen, again, I just wanted to show you the tools today that some you're familiar with and maybe some that you're not. But let's get these students engaged. And like I said, let's step into their world because they're all about innovative and, and using smart devices to do what they need to do. All right, fair enough, thank you. Now, one other thing. Cisco Network Academy, very, very important. Different schools, we've got them in high school. We've got them in colleges. They're in Wake Tech. They're in e ECU. They're in various schools around North Carolina. They're sanctioned by Cisco. There's a certain process that, that, that the educators or so schools have to go through. But what this does, it gives students a certification when they go through the course. Is it easy? Uh, no. But... It gives them a core, it gives them a certification, along with their degrees, to just have a little more ammunition when they come out to this world in engineering. Engineering is problem solving. So through the Cisco Network Academy, they can get C Cisco certified, Cisco certified network administrator, CSENT certifications, 
just to enhance and make them more valuable and more important word, competitive. All the engineers that came up today, they're going to need more people. It's just, a, it's, it's, it's just the way it is now. This Cisco certification could help them get there. And again, local academies, they're all over the place. It's a quick short story. I had two ex-offenders who came to me and said, Mr. Daugherty, we just got out of jail and we need some help. I said, well, gentlemen, Mr. Daugherty will help. I'm from New York, and if you mess up, I'm going to hunt you down. <laughs> Sent them to ECPI, School of Technology in Raleigh. Got them a couple of mentors. Ladies and gentlemen, two ex-offenders working for a Cisco partner, forty-five dollars to $50,000 a year. So my high school students, uh, High Bridge High School, I think it's up in um, Greensboro, Cisco Network Academy there. High school student, graduates, Cisco Certified Network Administrator, calls me back, Mr. Daughtry, you were right. I've got a summer job, $40,000 a year, 18 years old. I said, good, but go to college. Let's get that degree for what he did. But again, just these tools to get these students out there and make them valuable. Fair enough? Good. So, questions, but I would like to leave you with a quote as well from one of the great philosophers in our time. I'm not going to say I'm going to change the world, but I guarantee I will spark the mind that will. Tupac Shakur. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. All right, if our presenters could come on down, we've got ample time for questions for each of you. What powerful talks you provided, lots of ideas on many different sustainable subjects. Uh, so come on down and let's see what questions we have in the audience. And this is not a shy crowd and you've been collecting lots of questions I know. So um, let us hear from you. What are you thinking after hearing some of these presenters? Okay. Sure. So I'll first start with real slate. So real slate on a roof has been used in a lot of historic buildings and for a long time. Uh, slate, historic, or real slate as an example, weighs about 800 pounds for a square, which is a 10 by 10. An average home requires about $600 a year to have maintenance on that slate roof because it chips and it, and it cracks and you have to replace it. And after a while, your slate roof really looks like a patchwork because you can't, it's like anything natural. It's from a vein in the earth, and if you don't get it from that same vein, it's going to be different looking. This product mimics the look of the slate. Uh, it doesn't crack. You don't have to replace it, and it's half the weight. So you don't have to reinforce your roof. As We have a lot of historic buildings in the U.S. today that the roofs are deteriorating, that they're crumbling because the wood can't handle the weight of real slate. So this product allows a historically correct look to be maintained on these buildings without having to rebuild the buildings. Okay.
Uh, again, some of the social media sites, looking at those. Are you located? Where are you located? Just out of curiosity. Okay. All right, all right. And maybe some, maybe some more advertising. Do you, you go out to schools to speak, or do you bring the students to you? Because what I do at Cisco, besides going out to speak, I also host students on campus. I ply them with pizza. That always gets them to come on in. But I talk about technology. I talk about music. I like to talk about their music to get them into, to, for me to come into their world. But I've noticed a lot of self-advertising. Get the students to see you and to see what you do and to see more people in your organization. And bring a diverse group and also bring a diverse group of people from your area. What I also like to do is have those diverse people speak to those students. I tell them about my background, single parent family, grew up in the Bronx, things of that nature. I bring different various people from Cisco, growing up in rural North Carolina, struggling to get to the point where we are now. That now, you're talking to kids and starting to reach them at their level. That's something we have to do now, is actually come to their level before we can bring them to us. But I would suggest social media, but again, advertising, do more of that one-on-one. -on -one. I find a lot of that, my own personal opinion, my own personal experiences, to be more powerful than anything else. Because somebody, if you have some f folks in your organization, and they're talking about their personal experience and the way that maybe the way they grew up, the schools they went to, they're going to touch somebody. One of those kids out there is going to go, ooh, they sound like me. I kind of grew up, I'm growing up that way. I can do it too. Does that help? Well, I'll tell you this, that partnering is great. To partner with, you can't do it all by yourself. It's not gonna happen. Even Cisco can't do it all by itself. We partner again, you see Futures for Kids. There's different organizations that we've partnered with to help deliver that message. And I think if you're going that, that route, even using Facebook, have a Facebook page, have Twitter, use those things and make sure that kids understand that. But that partnering, because the, the village now was grown to, bring, to, to raise our kids. It's just not just one person as a village anymore, one company. It's schools, churches, companies, all getting together to get the message out to the kids. So that's a good idea what you have with that partnering, because we do it, and I do it as well.
mouse clicker for you um, so the right button advances the expect uh, this one to go just as well or even better so I'm the director of industry partnerships here at North Carolina New Schools and as you know we have a network of schools across the state and uh, what my job really entails is a lot of fun I get to basically connect industry partners with uh, schools and teachers and so this is just one way that we do that we have a lot of other activities that we do but uh, this conference is an opportunity to bring in some of our industry partners and let them share some of their expertise and knowledge and let and give you a chance to ask questions to find out more about their industry. It's all about making learning relevant. So we, we uh, really want to make sure our students that, have, that are coming through our schools to uh, have a, a future in mind of what they could be or what they could do. And so this is just one way to kind of keep the information out there where you can give ideas back to your students. And it's also a time for career readiness, so to help students prepare for the, the careers of the future. So uh, yesterday we actually had something called the Innovation Challenge, where we basically uh, challenged our students to come up with innovative ideas around how to, to impact their community, and they did a great job. We had uh, eight teams present to an audience and to a panel of judges, and a, a school out of Johnson County ended up winning the, the entire competition, so we're really proud of them. And so we thought we would give the students the time to present and be innovative and, and, and present some great ideas. And so the next day, today, we, we thought we'd bring in industry partners to present some great ideas, spark innovation, spark critic creativity, and start a conversation between our educators. So that's our goal for the life, for our, uh, for our lightning talks today. We really look forward to having our speakers. I'm just going to come up and introduce um, the uh, two at a time. So I'm going to introduce the first two speakers. So first, we're going to have uh, Greg Frick from Lord Corporation. Uh, he's a mechanical engineer, and he'll be talking about swarming mobile robots. And uh, all their bios are in the app. If you're in the app or you have it on your phone or device, you can pull up their full bio. I'm not going to read it. And then after him, we're going to have Christopher Kepley from the Joint School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering. And he's going to talk about commercial applications for nanotechnology. So uh, with no further ado, we're going to go ahead and start our first speaker. So uh, Greg, coming up, thank you for being here, and uh, we'll, we'll get going. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Greg Fricke. I got my bachelor's degree from Caltech, master's degree from Duke, and I'm currently a PhD candidate there. 
I've worked for Hughes Space and Communication, three different groups within the Boeing company, and I currently work for Lord Corporation here in Cary. I've built and worked on telescopes for the Air Force, and I've discovered asteroids. I've worked on the software and control systems for high energy laser pointing systems and helicopter active vibration control and for satellites as well. I spent most of the last decade researching and developing controls for distributed robotic systems. And all of that is because my natural curiosity was fostered by passionate teachers and mentors such as yourselves. Thank you for being those people for our next generation. Today I'd like to talk about robotic swarms and why they're neat, at least to me. Why do we call them swarms? What comes to your mind when you hear swarm? Bees or ants, termites? We sometimes call them flocks or shoals if we're basing our robot system on birds and fish. Bottom line is that we in this field of robotics take inspiration from the natural world around us. How do geese fly in the very recognizable V formations? Perhaps more importantly, why do they create those forms? How does a swarm of ants or termites know how to build a massive dirt hive? Individually, they're very simple and small creatures, but together they can create massive complex structures. And furthermore, if one ant or a hundred ants are killed from the hive, the remaining ants still have no problem completing that hive or carrying back that dead bug. Sometimes the how is more interesting and sometimes the why. We have to ask those different questions. Robots are typically said to be most suited to the three Ds, dirty, dull, and dangerous work. We know that manufacturing robots are used in widespread use all over the world in these types of applications, producing hundreds or thousands of parts per day, oftentimes exposed to thermal or chemical environments that could cause serious harm to humans. In pop culture, we often think about robots as being very advanced, robot-human hybrids, Terminator, Johnny Five, Data, Rosie from the Jetsons, of course, R2-D2 and C-3PO. What's difficult to realize, though, is that robots such as these are extremely complex and expensive machines requiring huge computational ability, tons of extremely sophisticated software, and absurd quantities of energy. The only reason to have robots like this is because they're designed to look like us and behave like us, like humans, and we want to interact with them as if they're our friends. If we apply the three Ds to mobile robots, there are some obvious applications where individual complex robots can handle dirty and dull work, like farming very large crop fields automatically. But that's more likely to be a tractor with an autopilot, not C-3PO. Or applying fertilizer and pesticides to that same field would more likely be done with an unmanned aerial vehicle rather than a humanoid bipedal robot. What about dangerous work? If a robot is too complex, it requires too much precision, depends on a particular means of locomotion or a refined surface to walk on, it could be easily disabled or destroyed in a dangerous situation. And if it's a very expensive robot, you could be out a lot of money. If instead we look towards simpler robots inspired by simple natural creatures and their simple natural interactions, it becomes clear that there are many advantages depending on their intended application. Imagine a scenario such as the one that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, the Deepwater Horizons explosion. After the initial explosion, oil immediately began leaking from the opened well on the ocean floor. The only way to monitor this gushing oil was to send very expensive, unmanned, remotely operated submarine to the ocean floor to take video with expensive high-resolution cameras. This is one application where building an autonomous submarine would make a lot of sense could make a good argument for that. But that robot could only inspect one location at any given time, rather than the entire plume that extended for miles. And what if that submarine was damaged down there at the bottom of the sea? Immediately the sy system no longer is functional, and there's no more information coming in, and you're out a lot of money. Consider instead many robots, dozens, hundreds, or thousands of them, linked together by short-range communication, Maybe all the robots have slight differences. Some have cameras, some have illumination capabilities, some have hydrocarbon sensors. With very simple rules, with relatively simple software, rather than extremely high-level artificial intelligence, these robots could distribute themselves around the active plume of oil, 
giving a much larger picture, three dimensions. And in this configuration, if one or even some of the robots become partially or completely disabled, the remaining robots can redistribute themselves, reallocating themselves to heal the communication network and fill in the remaining sensing gaps to maintain coverage of the spill. We call this graceful degradation, and it's one of the most obvious benefits of robot swarms. With a system like this, the estimates of the size of the oil plume could have been much more accurate. We recall there was widely disparate estimates. If you recall, there was another problem with the spill. Where did all the oil go? There was no way to track the oil as it spread throughout the Gulf. But if there had been a robot swarm deployed, the oil could have been tracked as it broke into distinct globs, some of it reaching the surface, some of it staying submerged and getting caught in the currents. This ability of a swarm to split or merge in order to maintain its tracking target is another great, great feature of swarms that individual, highly capable robots do not have. Another perfect application for a robot swarm was the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactor uh, tragedy uh, that were damaged by the massive tsunami in 2011. Many robots could cover this large area, providing real-time three-dimensional picture. Furthermore, rather than requiring robots whose sensitive electronics and sensors would need to be hardened against radiation damage, the robots could be made much more inexpensively, knowing that they may fail, but knowing also that if they do fail, the rest would continue to work, continuing to give you a picture. Some of the research I conducted at Duke was related to perimeter identification and tracking, similar to the Deepwater Horizon spill. This is a short video demonstrating our simple algorithm for perimeter tracking. These robots are very, very simple robots, and their sensing ability is practically nothing, but it's sufficient to find a perimeter. If the robots are close enough to one another, if they're within communication range, they share relevant information about their situation, specifically whether they're tracking the spill or not. Any other robot that's within communication range but not tracking the spill immediately moves towards the tracking robot. Quite quickly, then, the robots all find the spill and furthermore distribute themselves evenly around the perimeter. This automatic even distribution also allows the swarm to react dynamically if the shape of the perimeter should change, or even if it splits into two or more distinct perimeters, as shown in this animation. This animation uh, is from a real experiment. This is the tracking data, but we unfortunately lost the raw video. This is pretty much all I have. This is the final slide, and we're going to wait for the end of it here as the uh, split's going to happen. There it goes. So it changes shape, and they continue to redistribute. It splits, and one robot happens to be on that portion and continues to track it. And then it comes together, and they gracefully merge together again. Well, hopefully you'll agree with me that robot swarms are really neat. And uh, again, thank you, teachers and mentors. Yeah, does anybody have any uh, questions about that? Sorry, I, I think I spoke pretty quickly. <laughs> so that was um, a very, very simple algorithm just doing an edge detection. So they have infrared downward looking sensors you know, that just looks for a, a change in reflectivity. So it was a white floor with a, you know infrared beam on one side and a sensor on the other side. So if we see the sensor level change, we know that we've you know, found the edge. It had five different sensors on the front so you could kind of center the robot on that edge. You know, if you find it, kind of move a little more, move a little more, and then you're, oh, now they're all covered so you get back to the edge. So that was mostly just to demonstrate the tracking, al the communication and sharing algorithm rather than that. So, so the algorithm that we developed would be applicable to any system that had appropriate sensing capability. So soon after the Deepwater Horizon spill, MIT came out with uh, a few different studies where they had individual robots that had hydrocarbon sensors, like I mentioned, that would have been able to uh, follow gradients of concentrations of oil and get closer and closer. If they had a navigation algorithm like this, along with that, and you had several hundred robots, then they would easily distribute themselves around the spill. 
Um, same thing goes with radiation, you know, following the gradient to find it. All right, great. Yeah, great, thanks. Pass this over to you. Hi, my name is Chris Kepley. I'm an associate professor at the Joint School for Nanoscience and Nanoengineering. I'm an immunologist by trade, and now I dabble in nanomaterials. And when I say nanomaterials, any, we're talking about anything less than 100 nanomaterials or nanometers. And so what I'm going to talk about today is give you kind of overview. You might not have heard of what JSNN, the Joint School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering. It's a joint venture between North Carolina A&T and UNCG. It's a brand new facility right up the road on 40, $60 million facility full of not lots of cool toys to study nanomaterials. So we do a lot of outreach as well. So I would encourage you, if you want to bring your students on a field trip to the Joint School for Nanoscience, um, either email Daryl, he can give me your, uh, your contact information, or email me directly. You can just Google me. So what I'm going to talk about today is kind of the model for this uh, joint school, which is um, bringing in faculty to in all fields. So I'm an immunologist. I work with engineers. I also work with chemists, physis physicists. And the idea is to come up with I, um, cool projects that you can collaborate on from lots of different angles. And I'm a nine-month faculty member, first and foremost, but I also have three months, and the reason they brought me in is to start businesses. And we have actually started a business. Um, we actually just got some money from the National Science Foundation for a sustainable crustacean bait. I'm not going to talk about that. But we also have a, uh, an anti-aging molecule that we're, we're entering clinical trials. So the idea is, with the Joint School for Nanoscience, is when students have an idea, grad students, they can kind of foster it, their PhD program, their PhD project, and if there's a market there, they can go on and, and start a business and they'll be the CSOs and the CEOs of the company. So that's kind of the model that JSNN, um, it's a little different from most academic universities. So it's kind of, a, it's not really an incubator, but it has some of those aspects to it. So as I mentioned, I, I work with nanomaterials. One of the nanomaterials I work with are called Fullerenes. Fullerenes are nanomaterials. All they are are simple carbon spheres, and they were, they were discovered by a um, uh, guy named Richard Small. He won the Nobel Prize for discovering these molecules. Um, and I'm going to just give you a brief overview of three of the projects we're working on. The first has to do with, on the left-hand side, that's a, this is just simply a carbon cage with three, for all you chemists in here, it has three nitrogens held together, uh, or three gadoliniums held together by nitrogen. The gadoliniums, if you know anything about magnetic resonance imaging, MRI contrast agents, that's a, it's a common technique when you go to the physician to try to diagnose disease. Well, the beauty of what, uh, this one is more sensitive, and you can actually target this particular mag, uh, MRI contrast agent. So I'm going to talk about diagnostics and then theranostics. These are very potent antioxidants. Everyone knows what antioxidants is. They, they counteract reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species, some people argue that's the, why, the reason why we age. All diseases are associated with some type of reactive oxygen species. And so I'll talk about some therapeutics we're doing with that. And then on the final slide, I'll talk about blending the two, so giving a physician the possibility of diagnosing a disease and also treating it at the same time. So, as I mentioned, the first molecule is an MRI contrast agent. The problem with current MRI contrast agents is you can't target them. And when I mean target, and target them, diseases, most diseases have certain biomarkers. 
cancer has certain biomarkers that are unique to it, but this particular disease is atherosclerosis. So that what you're looking at, at the top, this is the aorta of a descending mouse who has atherosclerosis. So if you look at the very top, you can see, if you see, look here, 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 and here. You can see it gets wider. And what this represents is that contrast agent lighting up the plaque. So when you get atherosclerosis, you get what's called plaque in your blood. And when it ruptures, that's when you have a heart attack or a stroke. So we gave these mice atherosclerosis. And this slide just illustrates our ability to target that mouse and show that it has plaque in the arteries. So it gives it what, what, what the end goal is to give physicians a new tool to diagnose atherosclerosis and potential vulnerable plaque. The plaque is getting ready to rupture. Um, we also dabble with certain inflammatory diseases. As I mentioned, atherosclerosis is a huge disease. And what you're looking at here is a mouse aorta. This big thing right here is plaque. That's when you eat too many cheeseburgers. That's what happened to your arteries. This is another illustration. But if you actually give the fullerenes, the buckyballs is the other term for them, if you give them fullerenes in the water, you can see that it completely prevents this plaque buildup. And as a scientist, I'm interested in the mechanisms of that. We do a lot of biochemistry and um, signal transduction and immunology. Um, and you can see at the very top, those are different fullerenes that um, you can see how the lesions without fullerenes are very thick, but with fullerenes, um, the lesions are barely there. So diagnostics, therapeutics for atherosclerosis, and I'm going to turn the, and talk about cancer. You've probably all heard of glioblastoma. It's brain cancer. It's a very um, hard disease to treat. So we... what. With this picture on the left with the green and the yellow is a theranostic. So the little, the little round balls are the MRI contrast agent that will give the physician a, a way to uh, visualize where the brain cancer is. It's intercalated with a micelle, which is the green and the yellow, and it has a drug in it, doxorubicin. Doxorubicin is a, is a cancer drug that's very toxic. So what we're trying to do is target the, the brain cancer. And for some reason, glioblastoma cells have this, going back to the biomarker, when I mentioned biomarkers, they have this IL-13 receptor. So we decorated this theranostic with IL-13 ligand, so they'll bind to the, just bind to the glioblastoma cancer cells. And let me just focus your attention to this one because it's the most striking. So this is a mouse brain. We look at an MRI. And if you inject them with human glioblastoma cells, look down here, these are cell glioblastoma cells. They quickly overcome the mouse and the mouse dies. But if you first give our, our, our mouse uh, the theranostic, you can see that it prevents that glioblastoma from growing in the, in the uh, mouse brain. So that's just an overview of what we're doing. Um, if you have questions about my business, we can talk about that. But if you have questions about my uh, professorship duties, I'll be happy to answer any questions. All right, so I'm going to introduce our next uh, two speakers here. We have an uh, eager beer if he's already to get started here. Uh, we have Cal Snyder. He's, as you can see, he's brought some, uh, some aviation-related uh, material with him as well, so I'm sure he'll be talking about that. But he's the director of Next Gen Air Transportation, and he's going to be talking about unmanned vehicles. And then after Kyle, we're going to have Melissa DeRozier, who is the CEO of 3C Institute, and she's going to be talking about gaming technology and social development. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kyle. 
give you 10 minutes, I'm going to take every bit I get, right? So uh, so thank you all for coming today uh, and giving me this opportunity to kind of share what are the uh, emerging technologies in the state. Um, About three years ago, the uh, the governor said we need a UAV program, an unmanned aircraft systems, unmanned air vehicle program. Uh, I'm not calling them the evil D word. Uh, If you need to use the D word, you can use the D word, but I won't do it. Um, How many of you have... Um, something like this in your in your classrooms already. Uh, it's a Phantom, 1500 bucks. You can buy it on Amazon. They're selling 2500 of them a month. Um, this industry, this technology is here. It's not coming. It's here. Uh, so you've got one already? And you're flying them outside? No. <laughs> They're not hard to do, are they? That's good. Uh, so, so this is the big challenge right now is, is how do we manage these programs? How do we build these technologies? Uh, so about three years ago, like I said, uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation Division of Aviation gave me a phone call and said, we need to make sure North Carolina is incorporating these technologies, is building for this future. Uh, how about coming home to North Carolina and, uh, and, and building us an ecosystem that supports this growth? Um, I'm from here. I was born in High Point. I went to school at Catawba College over in Salisbury. I was a, a math computer science undergrad with a history and, uh, and honors minors. Uh, I did play ball for three years while I was there. I uh, took off from there, went out to the Tennessee Space Institute out in Tullahoma, Tennessee, and got a math master's. Uh, spent my summers there working out at NASA Dryden, now Edwards, uh, doing flight tests. Uh, ended up moving down to Georgia, working for aerospace companies, ended up working for a little software company, doing artificial intelligence to make these things smarter. Uh, while I was there, I picked up an aerospace MBA from Tennessee. Um, and since then, I've kind of turned into more of this project development, program development um, role. Uh, where I can't really tell you what I do, but you know, when you're growing up as a math kind of guy, everybody tells you you can do anything, even nobody tells you actually what that is. So, um, <laughs> so, so here I am now, uh, a career aviation guy, but I'm not a pilot. Uh, I'm not prior military. Uh, I'm not an aerospace engineer. So at NC State, they don't really know what to do with me either. Uh, so I get my own group at State. Uh, but we are flying weekly. Uh, I've got a team, actually they would have been out in the field today, but it was raining all morning and it was supposed to rain this afternoon, so that's why they weren't planning on flying today. But I'll show you some of the aircraft we're flying, um, some of the pictures we've been taking. But really since, like I said, about 2012, I came on board and started building up this infrastructure that said, how do we build North Carolina companies that want this technology, right? How do I do quick aerial survey, be it for agriculture, so I can go fly over a farm like Precision Hawk's doing down there in the bottom right corner? Uh, or Trimble up here, Trimble, the big navigation GPS company that says, let's go fly and do surveys. Uh, that's what they want to be able to do. So here's a tool for doing that. How do we help those kind of companies come to North Carolina and build here? Let's you know, involve our engineers that say, yes, we can go make this. If Lowe's was to come say, let's put a UAV on every shelf and every Lowe's across the country so you can check it out for the weekend and go survey, fly around your house before you tear up a spring garden. Maybe a good idea. I don't know. Uh, right now, they'll pull up Google imagery and, or, um, and, and Google Earth pictures could be, what, a year and a half, two, three years old. Uh, how about doing something new? How about actually go take those pictures live? Uh, so let's turn on our engineers to go do that. North Carolina's got every environment we would possibly want to test in except for deserts. We can use that. Let's offer those resources now through a managed program to say, okay, we know who's flying and where they're flying. Once we've done that testing in those environments, Let's put it back in those engineers' hands and say, okay, make me a product, right? Let's build this thing that does this need so that a user can do it. How do you make these things so smart that anybody can do it? We've got manufacturing in the state. We already know how to make airplanes. We've been flying them here for quite a while. Um, That's never going to change. But we know how to make them too. We've got airframers. We've got software people. You guys are producing electronics people. You're producing engineers. You're producing all kinds of people that fit those roles so that we can actually then go fly. And then we're going to start taking pictures like the stuff down here in the bottom left. This is high resolution imagery that a remote sensing analyst uses or that an agronomist uses now. And we know how to produce agronomy kind of people out of NC State, ECU. All of our schools have strong programs in that. So now we're actually not only building engineers, but we're also building the operator that says, okay, I know what my requirements are to fly this. I understand how airspace works. Uh, I understand the imagery that I'm now pulling off of this to say that's high resolution elevation data that I can now use for construction industry. We build all that into it. We know how to sustain these things and keep these things up and flying because if it's sitting on a shelf somewhere, it's not making anybody any money because if I bought it and I'm using it now as a surveyor or as a contractor, 
Uh, if I've just got it sitting on my shelf, that means I'm not out working. So how do we get them out and actually use it and build up that whole industry? So that's the ecosystem we've been trying to build now for about three years. That'll support industry growth so we can grow companies here just like these guys over here want to start companies. We want to see those companies started here too. Precision Hawk down in the bottom right corner, uh, that company's based here in Raleigh. Uh, they've got about 85 people right now. They're hoping to be 150-ish, certainly by the end of the summer, maybe by the end of the year. Um, building that airplane, they actually build them up in Canada, makes export controls a little easier. Uh, but they're building them and they're flying them out of here. They're shipping out a lot of people to go fly internationally because it's allowed to fly internationally for commercial business. Um, we're also working the policy side of this. Back to those things that math people aren't supposed to be doing, hanging out the legislature, mm, not a good idea. Um, but I'm doing it anyway. So we're trying to say, okay, how do we manage these things? How do we grow this here? Who, who is flying? Where are they flying? How does DOT uh, permit that? Just like you get your driver's license today. Uh, so that we can do all these different things. The Phantom flying, this was this guy here, uh, flying up in the top right. That was flying at the uh, state fair back in the fall. Uh, just kind of showing that off and we'll be doing that again this fall. The, the middle picture there on the right uh, is a near-infrared photography flying up at the NC State Butner Farm uh, where black spots on there are actually some of our cows. Uh, they're not reflecting chlorophyll. That's a good thing. Uh, so those aren't uh, infrared, so those aren't black hot, but those would be uh, near-infrared, so no chlorophyll reflectivity. Um, where are we flying today? And this is actually my last slide, so I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of slides. But we've got six places we're allowed to fly today. Our office is the only one that the FAA has approved for flying. Public agencies are allowed to fly once they've received a certificate of authorization. That's an FAA waiver that says, yes, you have certified your airplane is safe to fly, which we've done for both of these. Uh, and you've certified a crew that says, I always have a private pilot in the mix, uh, so that's who I get to go hire. Uh, so we've got 16 of these waivers from the FAA. We spread those across six different locations, across 11 different aircraft today. That'll probably be 20 airplanes by the end of the year. Uh, each of those aircraft does have an end number, a tail number, just like a Cessna 172, just like a big Boeing airplane. The FAA knows every one of those airplanes. Uh, we started flying. We had first flight part two on March 21st, 2013. Uh, we went out to uh, Hyde County Airport. Anybody been to Hyde? Nobody's out there. It's a great place to fly. Uh, and we actually love going out to Hyde. Uh, it's a big airport area. There's number three on our, uh, on our chart there uh, of the map. Uh, we've been flying for about 300 flights. I think we're actually up to about 320 now uh, and closing in on right around 100 flight, flight hours total. Our typical flight times to do an ag mission, go survey a field, is about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, we're working with the FAA. We're doing all of our airspace integration stuff. Our aircraft range from about these little guys like this, two or three pounders, up to that helicopter. That's a 300-pound helicopter that they've been flying for 25 years in Japan to do crop spraying in Japan. Um, so... Uh, that's where we're at. That's this industry we're trying to build. We're trying to grow in the state. Uh, lots of research at NC State. I was talking to Elizabeth, um, East Carolina before I came in. We're talking with Elizabeth City State. This is a UNC system-wide thing. We're trying to build into it where everybody gets to fly under our architecture uh, and our model so the FAA, the state knows who is flying and what they're doing with it. So uh, there's my stuff. Daryl knows how to get a hold of me. Uh, we'd love to host a demonstration, small groups, please, uh, but we can do that over at the NC State Lake Wheeler Farm, or if there's any of these other sites that are closer to you, let me know. Uh, we're happy to do that and, uh, and kind of coordinate that when we're out doing some test flights. Uh, and we've got all kinds of cameras, all kinds of things to show off. So uh, I think I've got time for questions. So we are not, everything, uh, all flying today has to be line of sight. Uh, and line of sight on an aircraft that's this size, that size, is, uh, is about a half mile radius. Um, we can fly above 400 feet, so we're not hobbyists. Uh, the university doesn't really fund hobbies. Tax dollars don't really fund hobbies. Uh, so, uh, so no, we are, uh, so, so we're actually doing research for that. So we actually can fly at Hyde County and up at Academy up in the Northeast. We can fly up to 1,500 feet. Um, and aircraft that are bigger than small UAS, and smalls are defined as 55 pounds. So right now we are on a DOT grant to build this industry in the state. Uh, and we're also on another DOT grant, North Carolina DOT grant, to look at using these tools as inspection tools for bridge inspections, small area surveys, uh, to see if, if this is something they want to invest in 
uh, for the state to say, okay, we need to routinely use these now for field inspectors. All of our information is available. You want to see pictures of corn? I got more pictures of corn than anybody cares to look at. <laughs> and it hasn't complained yet, just like the cows. Yes, sir. Um, so we have a, a working group statewide with all of our agencies that have participated. We have a law enforcement group specifically that is understanding what are the implications of them flying. Uh, looking at both the legislative side and the applications of what does it take to fly, what does it take to enforce the laws that are related to this. So uh, they are interested, but they are not flying yet. Uh, hobbies is uh, recreation, fun. Uh, if you're flying for a mission, be that surveying a field, be that uh, Real estate photography, wedding photography, all of that where you're a paid service and you're trying to make some kind of commercial benefit or you're the farmer flying that for his own commercial benefit, that's a commercial application. The FAA regulates that because that's what government agencies do, they regulate. Uh, but if you're a hobbyist flying for shits and giggles, go fly for fun. Yes. I can I can relate these technologies, this growing industry, to just about every discipline uh, out there. Uh, at NC State, and why we're based at NC State, is we work with all pretty much all the engineering departments, right? So the uh, the the mechanical and aerospace engineering program. Uh, we pull students out of there that do our airworthiness analysis. Uh, they've gone through that rigor of understanding what it takes to evaluate this airplane and say, is it safe to fly? The uh, postdoc I have on my team that is kind of my chief engineer uh, just finished up his PhD in electrical computer engineering. Uh, so he gets to be the software integration guy that understands all the rest of the brains that go on the inside. Uh, we work a lot with the uh, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, so they're providing remote sensing students that understand how to look at all this data and say, what does all this mean? Uh, I'm placing just as many students out of the crop science department right now into jobs as I am the engineering department because they want agronomy that say, okay, what does all this corn look like? Uh, is it healthy? Is it not healthy? Uh, what does multispectral imagery look like when we're flying over fields? Um, so that's why state's great and why we're trying to work with the other universities now to say, I mean, app states come to us and said, We've got forestry missions, we've got ag missions, how can we make sure that our students are trained too? Uh, and what we've tried to build here in the state is that ability to say, what do you want to do? Um, Elizabeth City State is our aviation sciences school, so that's where some of our pilot knowledge is coming from, but that's not our only place. So uh, if you're interested, I'd, I'd love to talk some more and, and, and help guide from there. We have one last question up top. Yes. No, that, that, that's, that's a great question, right? So, so my camera on here is a $10,000 camera. Uh, I'm not going to put that on a hobby airplane. Um, we are going to use these. Uh, it, why is this happening now? It's happening now because of the same technology. And of course, I'll leave my cell phone over there. That same technology that's in your cell phone that understands attitude and altitude when your phone's twisted and all that kind of stuff, and you can actually control a, a remote control car. The, Right, but it's all come together now into something that you can afford to put into here, just like the GoPro camera. Right. Exactly. And, and so now that you can actually do that now at a consumer grade for 1200 bucks, you can have that capability where, okay, I should be able to fly around my house and go take real estate photography with this. So it's just a scale. Now that it's come together and that's, that technology is going to continue shrinking, thanks to the nanotech guys that are doing some really cool stuff um, and, and seeing that. And when we've got Swarm guys doing their thing, uh, we're going to continue to make these things smarter. Uh, so there is that Amazon concept of package delivery. It's not happening in the next five years, um, but when we've got collision detection and coordination of robot-to-robot of -robot communications, uh, we're going to get there. Thank you. I'll stick around, so if you've got more questions. Thank you. So we're going to have Melissa come on up, with the CEO of 3C Institute. Hi there. How are y'all doing? So my voice sounds a lot worse than it feels, okay? So um, 
just bear with me if you can tolerate the, the sound of my voice, we can get through this. Um, so I am the CEO of 3C Institute, and I'm going to talk in a, in a couple minutes about what that is and what we do. Um, but first, you know, the topic here is talking about 21st century learning skills and the role of gaming technology in advancing those skills. So let's first kind of review what do we mean by 21st century learning skills. Um, they are a set of skills that students are deemed to need in order to be successful in school as well as in the 21st century workplace. There are three basic categories of these skills. The first one are literacy skills. Now, th this is kind of what you would think. It's literacy in media. How do you use media? How do you understand media? How do you understand and use technology? How do you understand and use information? Right, so these are kind of classic 21st century skills. If you're going to be in a high-tech kind of work environment, you need to have these basic literacy skills. But in addition to that, there are two other sets of skills. First one being what are called learning skills, which involve both creative and critical thinking. So being able to weigh options, um, look at the pros and cons of different options, critically think through a process and then make a choice. Be creative um, in your choice making and in the ideas that you generate. Then there's a whole nother set, actually, the majority of these would fall into something called life skills. Okay, so life skills include things like collaboration and cooperation and negotiation and communication, right? There's a lot of shuns. And so basically these are skills that in my area, because I'm a clinical psychologist, are in the area of communication and interpersonal skills. So one of the questions is, you know, in, in the area of STEM and encouraging STEM education, 21st century learning skills are centrally important. Being able to know the facts, know the formulas, be able to implement those are no longer sufficient for being successful in STEM careers. We live in a multidisciplinary, team-based science um, and mathematics approach. My son is an engineer. This is his first year at Carnegie Mellon University. And you would not believe how many of his day-to-day -day activities involve working in teams, working in groups on projects. You have to be able to have these basic communication skills, cooperation skills, etc., if you're going to be successful. So I'm going to give you a little example here um, I don't think you'll be able to hear it. We'll see, though. Do you know if we have audio? <clears throat> so I'm going to show you a little clip. This is from, I don't know how many of you know about the FIRST Robotics. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, school-based program teaching kids to work together to build robotics and then compete. And so I was watching, I was traveling, but watching my son compete in this competition and I kept hearing kind of the same words over and over again and kind of the same themes. And I want, I want to see if you guys can pick up on why I may be stressing this particular, oops, well, maybe not. How do you do this? I need to click. <laughs> oh, right here. Oh, you got a fancy version. Okay. All right, so let's see if this will work. No? Sorry, doesn't work. Do you have an idea about why it might not play? Technology. Technology literacy here. <coughs> it's a third. Watch 
Thank you. That's it. Yeah. So um, anyone know what they may have been doing? So this is a competition of two robotics teams competing to get the most points. So if you could hear it, what it would be saying is that um, in order to get the most points per team, there's something called cooperation. And so that would be the two sides of the team agreeing to get two uh, yellow boxes and go to the middle and stack them on top of each other. And so my son was telling me how what he would do is go around to the other teams and convince them that cooper cooperation was a good thing to do. So there's all this behind the scenes negotiation about if you do this, I'll do this. And if they are able to cooperate with each other, they got the highest points. To me, I was just, I was thrilled with that because it's a perfect indication of, you know, in the STEM area, you do frequently need to know exactly how to negotiate those relationships and how to work together. Okay, have I convinced you? Social emotional learning is important for STEM. That's the number one message. Um, then why is this important to me? Why, uh, why am I up here talking about this? I am a clinical psychologist. I am not great at engineering or math, though my kids and my husband are. Um, but what I do care about is that kids who um, may be experiencing some interpersonal issues, may be experiencing things like bullying or being left out. I've spent my entire career developing programs that can effectively help those kids. And my company is called the 3C Institute, and our goal is to bring evidence-based practices out there into the real world and to do like what you're talking about today, which is scaling, making sure that these effective uh, programs and tools are scaled to, the, to be as large as possible. So then what we do at 3C is we take games and we use game-based environments to teach kids these very critical 21st century skills in the area of learning and life skills. So how can you use technology smartly and also in an engaging way so that you actually bring the learning to where the kids are? The kids, as you know, are using games, are engaging with games more and more. So how can we use games in a positive way where we actually are teaching these 21st century learning skills and we're simultaneously helping them be more successful at school because they need those skills in order to, co to collaborate and to work together academically. And so I'm not gonna go into the details a bit about these various games. I'd be more than happy to gi give you guys demos. Um, Zoo U is the the game right now that is, um, it's been developed through Department of Education grants, has gone through randomized clinical trials, et cetera. It actually is the first and only evidence-based game for improving 21st century learning skills in that life skill area. So um, a little bit about why we chose to do games. Again, the number one reason is that it's an engaging way of teaching kids these 21st century skills. But then also in the school setting, which is where typically these skills are being taught or being focused on, um, it's very costly and takes a lot of time for teachers or schools to implement programs that are effective. So games are a way to very much scale and bring to all children the ability to learn and practice these skills in a safe environment. It also embeds uh, assessment. So one of the things is that you don't wanna just produce a game that is linear and static. It's very boring and you're not gonna get kids to play it. But more importantly, it's not gonna be very effective. So one of the things that our games do is they embed assessment. They're continually assessing how well the child is doing and it modulates things like the difficulty. So if a child is experiencing difficulty on a particular scene, they'll get more what we call pedagogical assistance. They'll get more help, more hints. The difficulty level will be lowered. Um, on the flip side, if a child is excelling at something, we'll make it more difficult. And so the advantage of the game is it's much like 
you know, if I were tutoring you one-on-one, -on -one, I'd be able to modulate my difficulty level, my pedagogical assistance. We can use games intelligently to do that too. Um, for a lot of different purposes. Mine is just in the area of social emotional learning, but certainly in the areas of physics and, and math and social studies, there's wonderful game developers who are working to embed that kind of assessment and to increase those skills. And then the last thing I'll say is that it's personalized. And that means, again, that the learning experience, if you took the, if you participated in the game, or you did, or you did, or you did, we would all have a different experience because the game responds to what you bring to it. Okay. And that's my last slide. Do I have time for one question? Sure. Okay. Any questions about? Yes, ma'am. <coughs> yeah. So our, we have multiple games. Um, Zoo You is elementary. Uh, Hall of Heroes is middle school. So right now we go from K through eight. Okay, all right. Thank you. All right, so we're about three quarters of the way through and uh, we got uh, two more presenters that's gonna come up and uh, continue to wow us. So we have uh, Amar Patel from Wake Med Health and Hospitals. He's a director of uh, the Center of Innovative Learning. He's gonna be talking about medical simulations. And then after him, we're going to have Christopher Gorman coming from NC State, who's a professor of chemistry. He'll also be talking about nanotechnology and how it changes the future. Absolutely. So um, thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity. And while uh, he's switching that slide deck, so I'm going to just introduce myself. My name is Marl Patel. I'm the director for the Center for Innovative Learning at Wake Med. My responsibility is to oversee all of the technology-based educational programs that we have throughout the system. And as you can imagine, healthcare is this very complex and crazy environment where technology is constantly changing. And so I'm tasked with figuring out the best and most creative ways to ensure that our, all of our employees are, are educated throughout that process. So I'm going to start with this slide, which is one of my favorite. So one of the things in healthcare is that we always thought something was the right way to do it. So let's go back to the 18th century. And there are a couple key things here to look at. One is it looks like they're pouring water into this poor guy's chest. Right? In the 18th century, the theory was that in patients that had tuberculosis, the only way to decrease the disease process was to remove the oxygen from the body. So how they did that was they created pneumothoraxes, so they created a hole in the chest wall, poured water in it, decreased the lung size, thus decreasing oxygen, and the idea was it would kill off the disease. What we once thought was the right way to go has obviously dramatically changed. Today, we want to get rid of holes in lungs. We want to get rid of issues in the chest. Our goal is to fix that. So 19th century, adventure of, uh, of antibiotics, and today we completely change our mindset and our, our thought process. Healthcare is this complex and crazy environment, and it's competitive. It's highly, highly competitive, but the unique thing with healthcare is that it's hard to standardize the process. In a normal shopping area, there are maybe a thousand charge codes associated with uh, any given um, ailment. In healthcare, there are millions of charge codes. There's not one way to put a stent in. There's five ways, or 10 ways, or 15 ways. But what is the right way for that individual patient? It's not about the money. You know, in old school, it used to be always about the money, or is it about the people? That's always a good question that always pops up. For us today, it's always about the focus of doing what is right. In today's healthcare market, there's something called accountable care organizations, and we're held accountable for the care that we deliver. Well, how can we be held accountable if we don't know what that care delivery process is? So much of for us has changed over the years to a focus on innovation and technology to the extent that even our aspirational goals today focus on that innovation process. So we're changing the paradigm in healthcare education to focus on that innovation principle. They look at six domains of medical practice, and what's interesting here to look at is that medical knowledge, professionalism, interpersonal skills, practice-based learning and improvements, and patient cares are all dominating this, this domain. Teamwork and communication account for 90% of the errors in healthcare. 90% of the errors. Something as simple as somebody talking to somebody else can result in a fatal error to occur. So how do we change that process? How do we change that mindset that we must communicate? 
What we live off of the model in healthcare education has changed to is something called Kirkpatrick's model. And all of us are familiar with the Kirkpatrick theory. We put a spin to it to add a healthcare element to it. For us, we look at levels one, two, and three quite frequently, but then level four pops up as a result of the Accountable Care Organization or the Accountable Care Act, where how does that change professional practice and what benefits, what direct benefits occur to the patient? And how do we chance that? Oftentimes, the first time we know there's a benefit is when that real patient leaves the hospital or leaves that environment. How do I test that process to make sure that it's there? To accomplish both the domains and the Kirkpatrick's theory, we, we sought out to look for changing a couple things, culture, needs, and gaps. We wanted to identify the gaps that were present. We want to understand the needs in the organization, and arguably, we have to change the culture and the mindset. In medicine, for years, it was physician-focused. The doctor was always right. In today's healthcare practice, it's team-focused. Not everybody, everybody in the room has to understand the process and the plan of care in order to change that process and procedure that's there. So we had a focus on safety. And that focus on safety really looked at feedback, repetition, range, individuality of learning. All of us learn in different ways. How do we create individual learning plans to ensure that you're successful in your career? We have seasoned providers. We have new students. We have people that, have just, uh, that are still going through medical school and medical process. But we have to make sure that the entire team understands those vast differences in procedures. So we leverage technology as that. So what you'll see here is a vast array of stuff. And I want to introduce to you um, this piece of technology in the bottom right-hand corner. That's a human patient simulator. Just like you and I, he breathes, he blinks, he pees, he poops, he screams, he yells, he pukes. What goes in does come out, right? And so he has an artificial circulatory system. The unique thing with him is I can do just as many procedures on a robot as I can on a real person. So think of it this way. Imagine that you have an abnormal heart, and you're getting ready to have a very, very dramatic heart procedure done. You're the first patient that doctor has ever done that procedure to with that dramatic of a condition because it is that rare. Do you want to be the guinea pig? So we leverage the idea of 3D, robot, of 3D printing and robotics to be able to replicate that entire process. Imagine being able to stent that heart for the first time in that environment. We're able to treat the patient, understand the physiological impacts, and then understand the long-term implications of that care that were delivered all in a robotic environment. The unique thing here is that we do this in an inside to or in a, in a develop. So on the, in, at the main campus of the hospital, we have a 10,000-square-foot virtual hospital built out focused on that education. We take the technology out into the street, bring it back to the hospital. It doesn't matter. So a lot, there are lots of opportunities and options. We're obviously in an area where we have Sharon Harris right around the corner. Um, and so one of the things we're also required to do is drills face focused on radiation exposure and management. And so you can see just the leverage of technology and the team practices that come into play. We are able to decipher processes, um, improve patient outcomes and care. Again, focus on teamwork and communication and processes. And so the unique thing with this environment is we're able to make errors without ever harming a real patient. We can solidify those processes to ensure that we're all safe at the end of the day. So just some neat, neat technology. This is being integrated. You're seeing this more and more in schools across the country. One of the neat things that we've started to do with a lot of this technology is we do a mini med school every year. And the mini med school focuses on your 7th through 12th graders, so the high school focus. The idea is to introduce them into medicine, give them the tools that they need to be successful if they want to get into medicine. So we give them a little bit of anatomy and physiology, a little bit of mat med math equations, a little bit of CPR, a little bit of surgical procedures. They get a little bit of everything. Some love it and some hate it. So the folks that don't like it have an opportunity to be able to change their topic or their focus or what their career goals are early on in their career. So just a lot of different opportunities leveraging technology. But this saves lives. It saves countless lives across healthcare systems. And that would be my last slide. Me, uh, reach out to me. So my contact information is up top. Anything else? Cool. Thank you.
Thank you. How's everybody doing? Good. So my name is Chris Gorman. I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry at NC State. I've been doing nanoscience my whole career, even before it was called nanoscience. Uh, but uh, let me give you a sense of what it is in general and uh, how we do it and what it means in terms of the future of discovery, which I think is a very important thing that your students care about. How can they be discoverers? So, let me see if I can get this to work. Right button? Okay. So, let's define the nanometer scale. Uh, if we start with the sort of length scale that we're used to, and we go down one, two, three, four orders of magnitude, we get down to microorganisms, white blood cells, red blood cells. Um, we're still not at the nanometer scale. We're going to go down one, two, more length scales. And we're going to start to see the double helix of DNA. That's a big molecule, um, a very well-organized molecule. And somewhere in here is the realm of nanoscience. And why do we care about this length scale? Uh, well, there's a lot of interesting phenomena that go on at this length scale uh, that we have yet to fully harness that could be very profitably harnessed. Um, we've already had a talk about nanomedicine. This is a picture to augment it. Um, turns out you can make particles uh, that glow in the dark. Um, the size of the particle determines the color of the particle, and so there's a very simple formula for how to make a particle of a given color. And then there's a bunch of molecules that you can de use to decorate the outside of the particle. It actually, they're there to stabilize the particle, but uh, they're also there to impart function if you want to. So let's put functional groups that like to bind to different kinds of cells, or functional groups that like to bind to just the nucleus of a cell. So if you're a molecular biologist and you need to be able to color code what's going on in your biology, this is a way to do it. Furthermore, those particles can have uh, molecules on their surface which deliver various therapeutic agents as well. And so there's a possibility for therapy here. Nanoparticles, things that are about 100 nanometers, tend to fly under the radar screen of the immune system, more or less. And so that's another uh, advantage to them. OK, in physics, uh, if I took two wires and put a piece of plastic in between them, an insulator, you would expect that no current would flow through that piece of plastic. And that is absolutely true until you get into the realm of the nanoscale when quantum behaviors start appearing. You have a charge on one side of a hill, and then, boom, the charge appears on the other side of the hill. Uh, this quantum teleportation is known as tunneling. And when we do electronics at this length scale, something I'm going to touch on in a minute, we have to take these kinds of behaviors into account. This is a really cool picture right here. What this is, is somebody's arranged a bunch of iron atoms, each one of those of those little peaks is an image of an iron atom. And that's cool right in of itself, that you could push iron atoms around on a surface uh, and get them into that corral. But look what's going on in the middle. You see these waves? That's the interference of the electrons associated with those atoms. So there's, that's, that's actually an electron interference pattern due to those, those atoms. OK, can we do things that are really functional at the nanometer scale? Actually, not really. We still have a lot to learn. And in fact, my talk is going to dwell on what we have to learn and what we have to do. But here's the existence proof that you can do really complicated things at the nanometer scale. Ribosome is a collection of about 55 proteins. It reads messenger RNA, and it makes other proteins. It is the apparatus that makes organisms run, makes life run. Um, it can make a whole bunch of different proteins. Uh, the proteins themselves have an incredible array of functions. If you want to bind oxygen, you want a protein like hemoglobin. If you want to regulate blood sugar, you want a protein complex like insulin. If you want to 
control the rates of chemical reactions in your body. You do want to do that. Uh, if the rates of chemical reactions in your body start to change even a little bit, you, you, you're done. So uh, proteins, enzymes do that. And these are all very sophisticated jobs that are all being done at the nanometer scale. Now, let's talk about how we might do this. Let's make nanometer stuff. Well, we have a lot to learn, yet we want to learn. We want to be able to make things that are nanometer in size. Let's take computer circuits, for example. Right now, we actually do make them pretty close to 50 nanometers in size. Uh, we want to go smaller. Why do we want to keep going smaller and smaller? Why over the last 50 years have people tried to make, among other things, computer uh, circuits smaller and smaller? Well, because as you make computer elements smaller and smaller, you can put more and more of them on a given amount of real estate. And since they're closer together, they can communicate faster with one another. So I'm sure you're all uh, have uh, been around on the earth long enough to recognize when computers were substantially uh, larger, substantially slower, and substantially more expensive. And this is, this, this shrinking is, is what's uh, given rise to that, that reduction. So, I talked a little bit about the natural world and how functional it is, and I talked a little bit about how we're being challenged in uh, how we're going to do stuff at the nanometer scale. So here's the last thing I'm going to talk about. Basically, if you go to a factory, what we typically do in the factory, what we do when we make computer chips, is we take a hunk of material and whittle down what we want out of it. Contrast that to something where you could take little parts, and if they could click together, you could build up something from the bottom up. This is subtractive. This is additive. This is how we do stuff when in our factories, but prior to our brief existence for several billion years, this is how nature did it, biological manufacturing. And it turns out that top-down Whittling out little features gets harder and harder to do as things get smaller and smaller, but bottom-up manufacturing gets harder and harder to do as things get bigger. And as we're going small, we should consider how bottom-up manufacturing might play a role. Here's a fundamental thing you want to be able to do in bottom-up manufacturing. This is how nature works. This thing I'm showing you here is a picture, is a cartoon of a tobacco mosaic virus. Harmless to us, not so much if you're a tobacco plant. What's remarkable about this thing is that it is composed of exactly 158 copies of a coat protein, and that protein is the same for everyone, and I can write down the molecular formula of that protein. I can account for every atom in that protein, so I can account for every atom in that object. It's a molecule to me from that standpoint. Take it, disrupt it, break all the proteins apart. Then take the disrupting agent away. That'll reconstitute itself as a fully infectious virus particle. Okay? Now, how does that work? Well, within those proteins, there's enough information, there's enough of, of a way that they want to or inclined to click together so that if you just let them do their thing, they will self-assemble back into an infectious particle, okay? So we need to figure out how to do this if we're going to do manufacturing at the nanometer scale. It just seems to be an inevitable thing. Um, now, I'd love to be able to tell you that we've developed a 55-gallon drum full of a powder that when you pour it in your bathtub and add water, the next morning there's a Ford Explorer waiting for you. I'm going to show you how little we know how to do so far, but here's a way to mix some top-down ideas and some bottom-up ideas and take a first baby step in nano manufacturing. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a pattern 
and we're going to pour a liquid prepolymer on it. A liquid prepolymer is just a, a liquid that cures up, hardens up. You've used two-part epoxy. You've seen in Mission Impossible where they make casts of people's face and impersonate other people. Same idea, okay? That stamp can then be inked with molecules, and these molecules have sulfur atoms at the, at the end of them, and th those sulfur atoms like to stick to gold. And the tails are such that they like to arrange into rows and columns, like, like uh, um, soldiers at a parade. I'm on my last slide. And we can, they'll spontaneously self-assemble across the whole surface, but in combination with the stamp, we can direct them to form patterns at somewhat larger length scales. And now think about starting to build some function into those patterns. Is it sophisticated? No, no, it really isn't, but it's a start. Um, it's something that has been developed over, over some time. Uh, the thing is that when you, st and this is, this is the end of my talk, when you get into an area where you don't know how to do very much, there's a lot of opportunities for discovery. In fact, anything you can come up with, even if it's sort of simple, could be sort of a big discovery, a big step forward. And that's the fun of discovery, and that's what we try and do at NC State, and that's what we hope we'll be able to continue to do with the next generations of students that you will send to us. Thank you very much. to ask a few questions just uh, direct your question to whoever you uh, you know you want them to answer the question all the, the, the presenters are listed in your app um, so we'll go ahead and get started with questions and answers we have about uh, 20 minutes so we'll start here and then we'll go up top there So I'm not sure about specifically addressing the parents, but I will say that at my undergraduate institution, um, collaboration policy was explicitly, it was critical. You know, we were told you will not be able to do your homework by yourself. This is a hard enough problem or there's, it's an extensive enough thing. We were encouraged to work in groups of four, five, six, ten even on some things. And that's a huge part, I think, that is um, why I've had some good successes in engineers that I was forced isn't the right word, but encouraged to work collaboratively, you know, early on rather than competitively, which at younger ages it was always competitive. Who's got the best grades and all those things? Getting into college, who's got the best SAT scores and all that? But it's not about that. You, you definitely, so I would certainly encourage for your students making it um, team-based projects are critical. And even if you can get them working on homework sessions and, and things like that at, uh, at younger ages, that's much better. I think from the healthcare side of the world, for at least us, we so much of what we do is inter interdisciplinary team training, right? And so we're focused on that teamwork and collaboration. And oftentimes, for at least our mini med school group, we encourage parents to either watch their students work together and see how problems are solved. So sometimes seeing is believing. Um, and so we we often encourage them to be part of that process, to be part of, to be there for this for their individual child. The other side of it is also giving it to them, giving them the same problem and say, okay, figure it out. This is what your child feels like. So reverse, the, reverse that process and make them go through that same steps. Uh, having worked on the industry side too, um, students that have team experience, uh, whether getting into college or then on, on the outside, I know the industry partners I know that are coming to me and saying, who do you have? The ones that have been on these first teams, the ones that have been on college teams that have been out competing, whether we, we built a robot, we built a UAV, we built this, uh, those are the ones that are getting picked up quickly because they've got the interpersonal skills too to go along with the rest of the engineering and the rest of that kind of build out. So um, that's what I always encourage parents to say, you know, get, get your kids involved in, in team things so they got that collaboration from the start.
When you do nanoscience, it's an extremely, the word interdisciplinary was used. It means that the problem's bigger than what a chemist or a physicist or an engineer is going to be able to sort out all by her or himself. And I tell my students, I tell graduate students, undergraduate students, part of the game is going to be figuring out what other people care about, why they care about it, uh, who think differently than you do. And so that's a learned behavior. I don't think that's something that you're born with. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was gonna say, that, that's a pretty easy one. Um, so I lived outside of Orlando in the early 1980s. Uh, so I did see the first space shuttles launched in the backyard. Um, and, and so space has always been a thing. Uh, Dad's an inch taller, was an inch taller than I am, so I never knew I was going to be an astronaut. It was never really an option. But wanting to be involved in that. So um, exposure early on was, I mean, my parents just kind of said, you know, let's get out and go go to zoos, go to space stuff, do all that kind of thing. But the, the space shuttle launches, uh, still the coolest thing on the planet. Um, unfortunately, we can't see them anymore. Um, but um, that's, that's the easy one for me. So that's why any time uh, we can do something at an airport with aviation, exposure to airplanes, touch them, feel them, know how it works, um, that's what I try and provide. I got two. The kids' rockets that go up in the air with the parachute, that was the awesome one for me. But the other one was, we used to do, in elementary school, we used to do the egg. And the idea in physics was, you know, create a shell around the egg and then launch it. And that was the moment, that was the, the cool moment for me to be able to figure that out. So. <laughs> and that's it. have a new aerospace school we're opening this uh, this, this fall and it won't be part of the state but we will uh, we'll be talking about that as well so uh, thank you guys for being part of our audience and uh